Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's lecture. Uh, this is the CSA Level 2 umpiring course. It is now 18.30 South African time. Tonight, uh, I'll be covering Law 24 and 25. Tom will then be covering Laws 27 and 28. But I'll kick off by quickly going um, over last uh, week's uh, revision question. And then Tom will also do this week's revision questions. And after that, we will open the floor for Q&A. So the first question last week was uh, five instances where the ball becomes automatically uh, dead. There are seven listed below. Um, you can name any five. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, they are on the screen. Six was to name five instances where the umpire must call and signal dead ball. So the first one, the ball becomes automatically dead um, at the event. For example, when a, a, a batter gets dismissed, the ball becomes automatically dead. But these five instances that, we, that we're covering now, they want when the umpires must, must call and signal dead ball. And they are when the umpires intervene in, in case of unfair play, possible serious injury to a player or umpire. There are about nine or ten of them. Any five will do. So just to recap, uh, the first five we covered is the ball automatically becomes dead, even though the law tells us the ball automatically becomes dead, but it's good umpiring technique or practice to call and signal uh, dead ball. Uh, lots of players don't know the law. For example, if the ball hits the helmet behind the, the keeper, yes, the law tells us the ball automatically becomes dead, but good practice just to call and signal dead ball. And the and the ten that we are looking at is where the um, either umpire needs to call and signal dead ball. The next revision question was: the as the bowler gets into his delivery stride, one of the bales falls off at the striker's end. What do you do? So you, uh, either umpire needs to call and signal dead ball immediately. Uh, nine out of ten times, it would be easier for the strikers in umpire to call this, but there's nothing stopping the bowlers in umpire if he or she uh, saw it clearly to call and signal dead ball when one of the bales falls off at the strikers in before the, the batter received the ball. If neither umpire saw it and they didn't call or signal dead ball, play will continue as normal. We also covered no ball and then immediately after the call of no ball, to call and signal dead ball. There shouldn't be a pause. It is immediate. So you call and signal no ball, and then a split second later, you call and signal dead ball. So those two in instances are when the ball coming to rest in front of the striker's wicket. So you will call and signal no ball and immediately call and signal dead ball. And also, if a ball was delivered by the bowler, uh, it, a fielder then intercepts a delivery. If that is the case, you will call and signal no ball and immediately call and signal dead ball. Three ways of how a batter can be dismissed of a no ball. Hit the ball twice, obstructing the field and run out. What other ways uh, our batter can be dismissed of a wide ball? There are four ways. And they are hit the wicket, obstructing the field, stumped and run out. 
the first law for this evening is field is absent and substitutes. And we will start with substitute. So what is a substitute fielder? And who shall allow a substitute fielder? And when will you allow a substitute fielder? Firstly, it is for the umpires to allow a substitute fielder. Only the umpires, they decide whether a substitute fielder shall be allowed or not. Or not. It's not for the, uh, the captains nor the coaches. It is for the umpires to allow. So when do they allow a substitute fielder? If the umpires are happy that a fielder has become injured or ill and that this injury or illness occurred during the game. So if a player becomes injured or ill during the match, the umpire shall allow a substitute fielder. Captains has no say. It is the umpires for them to allow it. There are instances, except for uh, injury or illness, where the umpire shall also allow a substitute fielder and this is uh, where the law uses the word wholly acceptable reason. If there is a wholly acceptable reason why a player is not on the field or needs, needs to uh, leave the field, if that is the case, a substitute uh, fielder shall also be uh, allowed. Uh, this is an example of a wholly acceptable uh, reason. In the um, first class competition uh, in South Africa, there are many university students that uh, that play for their respective provinces. Uh, there are times where they do write exam. Um, let's say the, um, we play four day cricket, so starting a Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Sometimes they do write e exams on a Saturday from let's say eight till twelve. That is an example of a wholly acceptable reason where the the fielder is not able to take the field. Where the game usually starts at 10 o'clock. He'll probably only get to the field around half past 12 or 1 o'clock. But the reason why he's not on the field of play is because he wrote the exam the morning. That is just an example of a wholly acceptable reason. Also, a substitute shall not be allowed to bat, not be allowed to bowl. He or she cannot act as captain, uh, but that substitute fielder may act as the wicketkeeper. But to act as a wicketkeeper, they need the consent of the umpires. So the substitute not allowed to bowl, nor bat, nor be captain can keep, but to keep, they need the consent of the umpires. So a fielder being absent or leaving the field of play. If I can just quickly give you a bit of background. Uh, this law uh, was changed over time. Uh, many, many, many years ago, fielders could leave the field of play as they wish. You would find a, a bow, uh, opening bowler bowling a five over spell. After the five over spell, the opening bowler would then leave the field of play and, and go sit in the change room. A substitute fielder would then come on, on for, for the bowler. Uh, hour later, when the, it's time for the opening bowler second spell, he or she will then return to the field of play, bowl the second spell, after the bowling five or six overs, the bowler would then again leave the field of play. So literally for the whole day, that opening bowler would, would be on the field of play for, let's say, an uh, hour, hour and, and a half. Same applies to batters. Uh, opening uh, batters or the top order batters uh, would be uh, close to the time to bat. They would then leave the field of play to go put their feet up, take a sour, uh, get a bit of rest to be fresh when the uh, when it's time for them to bat. Uh, obviously, that is not, not fair. The lawmakers uh, agreed. They then decided to tweak this law a bit 
and we will now um, see how they tweaked uh, this law. So what the lawmakers decided was that, so if a fielder is not on the field of play at the start of the game, or that fielder leave the field of play at any time after the start, what do you as umpires need to do? Firstly, yes, we'll allow the, the, the fielder, if the fielder became in, um, injured or ill, we'll allow the fielder to go off. That fielder needs to inform either of the umpires the reason why he or she is leaving the field or why he or she is not present on the field of play. That's the first thing. Secondly, if that fielder that now went off wants to come back onto the field of play, that fielder needs the consent of either of the umpires before he or she can return to the field of play. Then the fielder that was now off shall not be allowed to bowl until that fielder has been on the field of play for the same amount of time that the fielder was off the field of play up to a max of 90 minutes. Tom will go through a few examples in the revision questions that will illustrate this point clearly. But just to emphasize point number three again, before the player that went off the field of play is allowed to bowl, he or she needs to be on the field of play for the same amount of time that he or she was off the field of play. There's a quick example. Player leaves the field at 10.30, returns at 10.50. How long was the player off? 20 minutes. So if the player came back onto the field at 10.50, when can that player bowl again? Yes. That player needs to serve 20 minutes of penalty time. So at 10 past 11, that player can bowl again. Just to cover a bit of field craft, um, how to handle a player leaving the field. So if a player comes to you saying, umpire, my, my shoulder or my hammy, um, I need to go see the physio. You then take out your book, you write down the player's name, you write down the reason why the player is leaving the field, and you write down the time when the player left the field of play. Then you also tell the player, uh, so player, so let's say um, Johnny, when you return, please inform either of the umpires when you return to the field of play. You also tell his captain when. Uh, to tell, to inform you when Johnny is returning to the field of play. And when Johnny returns, you take out your notebook, you then write down the time that he, uh, he, is, uh, he returned, and you then calculate the amount of time that he was off the field of play. So in my example, Johnny left the field at 10.30, he came back at 10.50, so he was off for 20 minutes. So you confirm with the other umpire that both of you are happy that Johnny was off for 20 uh, minutes. You then inform Johnny that Johnny, you've been off for 20 minutes. You're only allowed to bowl 20 minutes later, which is 11.10. So you inform the bowler as well as you inform um, the captain when Johnny can bowl again. And penalty time is up to a max of 90 minutes. So what that means, uh, if, say, let's say Johnny was left the field of play at 11 o'clock and only returns to the field at half past four, the, uh, or four o'clock the afternoon. So even though you'll, Johnny was probably off the field, if I can just roughly count, count 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, for six hours, let's take off lunch and tea. So Johnny was off the field for five hours. That equates to 300 minutes. But the law say 
this uh, penalty time is up to a max of 90 minutes. So even though Johnny was approximately off for nine uh, for 300 minutes, the max time, penalty time that Johnny can serve is 90 minutes. So if Johnny returns at four o'clock, max penalty time is 90 minutes. So Johnny can bowl again at 17.30. So if a player leaves the field of play, having served all of his uh, penalty time, so number three and four, just they, they go together. So what three and four tells us is uh, that penalty time doesn't disappear. If Johnny hasn't served all his uh, penalty time, the, the unserved penalty time will carry forward. They do accumulate. So let's say Johnny was off the field uh, uh, for Johnny left the field at 10.30, he returned at 10, at 10 50. So that's 20 minutes. Then at 10 past 11, Johnny leaves the field again for another 20 minutes. So what the law is telling us is answer penalty time will stay. Uh, the, if he goes off again, you will add that penalty time to his unserved penalty time. Scheduled intervals does not get added to penalty time. It's only playing time that Johnny was off the field of play uh, that he needs to serve. Scheduled interval does not get added. Example, uh, let's say lunch is at 12 o'clock. Johnny, uh, Johnny left the field at 11.40. But 11.40 is off. Lunch is at 12 o'clock. So at lunchtime, how much penalty time does Johnny uh, owe us? He owes us 20 minutes from 11.40 till 12 o'clock is 20 minutes. So at the start of lunchtime, Johnny owes us 20 minutes. How long is lunchtime? Lunchtime is 40 minutes. So at 12.40, uh, lunch will end. Johnny then now returns uh, with his side onto the field of play. You will now inform Johnny and his captain the amount of penalty time that Johnny still owes us and when Johnny can bowl. So when can Johnny bowl? If we return after lunch at 12.40, Johnny owed us 20 minutes at the start of lunch time. Johnny can bowl again at 1 o'clock. He only owes us 20 minutes of penalty time. You don't now take the 20 minutes that Johnny owed us from 11.40 till 12 o'clock. Now there was a 40 minute uh, lunch break. You do not add the 40 minutes to the 20 minutes that uh, that he owes us. And now you say all together, Johnny owes us 60 minutes. No, only the playing time that Johnny was not on the field of play, that gets counted as penalty time. So Johnny can bowl again at one o'clock only needs to serve 20 minutes. So all scheduled intervals does not get added to penalty time that the fielder owes us. So what happens if there's an unscheduled break in play? Typical example of an unscheduled break is a, a rain interruption. So what happens if there's a rain interruption? So now the, the law was changed because players started abusing this law. They would uh, they would tell the umpire they are they are injured and sometimes they are not injured. They just want to go off and, and rest. So the lawmaker said, OK, um, umpires are not doctors. So if a player comes to you and say he is uh, um, he's, uh, Amy is, is a bit tight, he wants to go off uh, for um, for treatment, you'll, uh, you'll allow the fielder to go off. That fielder will then have to serve penalty uh, penalty time. So, so the lawmakers then, they change the law so that you will allow the fielder to go off and he needs to serve his penalty time when he gets back on. Okay. But they also allowed for unscheduled breaks in play, like 
a rain interruption to be offsetted from penalty time that the player owes us. Why Why would this be the case? Why would you uh, want to take off uh, an unscheduled break like a rain interruption from penalty time uh, served? Um, if it wasn't for the rain inter interruption, uh, Johnny would have, and play was, was going to continue, Johnny would have been on the field of play. So for, for that reason, the, the lawmakers decided that if it's an unscheduled break, you can offset that unscheduled break against the penalty time that the fielder owes us. But there are certain criteria that needs to be met. Let's have a look at what criteria needs to be met if you can offset an uh, unscheduled break, a rain interruption from penalty time that the fielder owes us. Firstly, the fielder was on the field of play at the start of the interruption. So at the start of the rain interruption, the fielder was on the field uh, of play. And at when the play resumes after the interruption, that same player needs to take the field of play. So if these two criteria are in place, you can offset the rain interruption from the penalty time that the fielder uh, owes us. This is uh, a quick example of, uh, of this. So Johnny leaves the field at 10.30. At 10.50, Johnny returns. How many minutes does Johnny owe us? 20 minutes. When can Johnny bowl? 11, 11.10. At 11 o'clock, it starts to rain. So at the start of the rain interruption, was Johnny on the field of play? Yes, he was. Because remember, Johnny took the field at 10.50. So at the start of the rain interruption, Johnny, Johnny was on the field of play. How many minutes does Johnny owe us at the start of the rain interruption? Only 10 minutes. Why 10 minutes? He returned to the field at 11, at 10.50. He owed us 10 minutes. He owes us, uh, he owes us 20 minutes. Then play continued up until 11 o'clock, so that's 10 minutes. So that 10 minutes, when it started raining at 11, you can take that penalty time off, um, of that playing time off the penalty time that Johnny owes us. So at the start of the rain interruption, Johnny only owes us 10 minutes. It rains for 10 minutes. So at 10 past 11, players returns to the field, including Johnny. So... Point number one is saying you can offset that 10 minutes rain interruption against the penalty time that Johnny owes us if Johnny was on the field of play when it started raining and he takes the field of play at the resumption of play, which in this case, which is the case. So that 10 minutes Johnny can subtract from his penalty time. So at 10 past 11, Johnny does not owe us any penalty time. Second instance, when you can offset the an unscheduled break against the penalty time that a player owes us. So point two say the criteria that now needs to be in place here is, so in this case, in the, in, in the example one, when it started raining, the player was on the field of play. In example two, when it started raining, the player was not on the field of play. And that's the difference here. So at the start of the unscheduled break, at the start of the rain interruption, Johnny, the fielder, was not on the field of play. So now, for that fielder to offset the unscheduled break against the penalty time that UC owes, that fielder needs to notify either of the umpires in person. He cannot send his captain, cannot send the coach. That player needs to, to inform 
the umpire in person as soon as he is fit again to participate. And from that moment that he or she informs the umpire that he is able or fit enough, then from that moment onwards, you can start offsetting the unscheduled break against penalty time that the fielder owes. Unserved penalty time does not disappear. If there's any unserved penalty time at the end of an innings or at the end of the day, it will continue or go into the next innings and it will carry forward into the next day. Doesn't disappear. Uh, yes, it will disappear uh, for the next match. You cannot carry, carry any penalty time over for, um, into a next game. But uh, if it's the same game in the innings, in the in the first inning, if it is still penalty time owes, it will go over to the second innings. On day one, if player X still owes us 60 minutes of penalty time, it doesn't disappear overnight, it will carry forward into the next day's play. There are instances where penalty time will not be incurred. What are those instances? If the player suffers an external blow during the game, and then that injured player had to leave the field of play. So the emphasis here is an external blow. Examples of external uh, blows are the short leg fielder, the the bowler balls a short ball, spinner balls a short ball, player cuts the ball into short legs uh, um, sin and and um, short leg goes down. That is an example of an external blow where the ball went against the 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 leg of the fielder. You saw it with the or the umpire saw it with the uh, with their eyes. So in that, those instances. If the player leaves the field of play and comes back, let's say that player goes off for 20 minutes, that player will not have to serve any penalty time because there was an external blow that happened, which the umpire saw. So any external blow, that is just one example. Other examples of external blows uh, are uh, ball gets it high in, into the air and two fielders converging on the ball. They run into each other uh, and both go uh, goes to ground. Uh, physio comes on. One of the players needs to leave the field. That's an example of ex an external blow where two players came together. One, they, one of the players then uh, subsequently had to leave the field to get treatment. In those cases, that's external blow. No penalty time will have to be incurred. Also, no penalty time will be incurred if the player was absent and not on the field of play for a wholly acceptable reason. Um, earlier, I used the example of a, a university student that, that, that wrote an exam um, on the Saturday and was not on the field of play, let's say, for two hours upon return. That was the only acceptable reason why the player was not on the field of play. So when that player returns to the field of play, he or she can, does not have to incur any penalty time. Earlier, I spoke about when a player goes off the field of play. Uh, it's important that the umpires, the good umpiring techniques is to mention to the player when you do return, just please inform either of the umpires when you return. Also tell his captain to let us know when that player returns to the field of play. Because if that player returns to the field of play without permission, there are quite a strict punishment and we'll see the punishment now. So what happens? So that player comes onto the field of play without either of the umpire's permission, 
And as soon as that player comes into contact with the ball while, is it, while it is in play, the ball shall immediately become dead. The umpire shall award five penalty runs to the batting side. Runs completed by the batters shall be scored together with a run in progress. If they cross at the instant of the offence, the ball shall not count as one for the over. The umpire shall inform everyone, the captain, uh, the captains um, will inform and report this to the governing body. So you can see there's a fairly strict punishment if a player comes onto the field of play without permission and comes into contact with the ball. So that's why good umpiring technique before as the player leaves the field, just remind him, let me know uh, when you come back, also tell uh, uh, inform his or her captain because if they do come onto the field without permission and you need to then apply the law, the captain, you can tell the captain, I've informed you to let me know. Um, you didn't inform me. Unfortunately, this is the punishment that you get if a player without permission, while the ball is in play, comes into contact with the ball. My last slide for for this evening before I hand over to Tom. In terms of we've now covered uh, when a, a fielder is off the field of play, that fielder needs to serve uh, penalty time before uh, EOC can bowl again. The same applies if if uh, the fielder owes penalty time and uh, his or her side is now batting. That player still needs to serve unserved penalty time. So that player is not permitted to bat until that penalty time has been served. So if that player owes us, let's say, 30 minutes uh, when the last wicket uh, fell, now side B is going to go into bat, but that player is, uh, is let's say, the opening bat. Unfortunately, that player will not be allowed to open the batting because that player still owes 30 minutes of penalty time. So the innings needs to be in progress for 30 minutes before the opening bat can come into bat. Or the law allows that if the side that lost five wickets, even though they did not, uh, he did not serve all his penalty time, that player can bat if the side has lost five wickets. So the same principle applies in point number two, when there's an unscheduled stoppage, uh, where a player needs to uh, feel the need to notify the umpire, either of the umpires in person, the same principle applies to the batter. Once that batter is uh, fit again, that batter needs to, to inform the umpire in person. And as soon as the batter informed the umpire, then the the uh, the unscheduled break can be offset against any penalty time served. Tom, thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, over my side. Uh, I'm handing now over to you to bowl the the next over from the other side. So over to you, Tom. Thanks, Abdullah. Good evening, candidates. I'm going to take you through Law 27 as well as Law 28, and then we shall go into the revision questions over these four laws, after which we shall go into questions and answers from your side. Law 27 is the wicket keeper. Let's see what the law has to teach us about the wicket keeper do's and can't do's. We all know that the wicket keeper has got special protective equipment. He or she is the only fielder permitted to wear gloves and external leg guards. If these are worn, they are to be regarded as part of his or her person for the purposes of fielding the ball. If by the wicket keeper's actions and position, when the ball comes into play, it is apparent that the umpires to the umpires that he or she will not be able to carry out the normal duties of a wicketkeeper, 
he or she shall forfeit this right and also the right to be recognized as a wicket keeper. It does happen quite often in six aside cricket that you find a wicket keeper falling all the way back to the boundary, which then technically disqualifies that person as a wicket keeper because that is not a normal position for a wicket keeper. Uh, so there, in effect, he or she will have to discard his or her external pads as well as gloves. OK, so a wicket keeper can only wear the special protective equipment allowed to be worn by a wicket keeper if they are in the position of the wicket keeper, a normal position of a wicket keeper. Obviously, for spinners, wicket keepers usually stand up to the stumps. And for medium paced bowlers and fast bowlers, wicket keepers stand a little bit back. Uh, but never as far back as the boundary. Uh, that is not a normal position for a wicket keeper. Let's have a look at the gloves that the wicket keepers are allowed to wear. They cannot be webbing between fingers. Um, between the index finger and the middle finger, you can see there there is no webbing between the middle finger and the ring finger, there's no webbing between the ring finger and the pinky. There is also no webbing. Uh, there is webbing allowed between the index finger and the thumb. However, over the years, the allowable webbing between those two fingers has been decreased. It used to be a nice pouch that the wiki keepers could pretty much catch anything in. Uh, but nowadays that webbing is restricted. The material needs to be single pieces of non stretch material. And only between the index finger and thumb, as mentioned. When a hand wearing the glove has the thumb fully extended, the top edge and not protruding beyond the straight line joining the top of the index finger to the top of the thumb. So all we're saying here is that we cannot have an arch higher than the line, straight line between the top of the index finger and the top of the thumb. The position of the wicked keeper I've touched slightly on. The law has more requirements as to where a wicket keeper should stand. The wicket keeper shall remain wholly behind the wicket at the striker's end from the moment the ball comes into play until a ball delivered by the bowler. Um, now, when the law says the wicket keeper shall remain wholly behind the wicket, that does not mean that the wicket keeper has to be in line with middle stump behind the striker's stumps. All this means is that the wicket keeper shall be entirely behind the bowling crease. OK, so we're not talking about the line of the wicket keeper here. We're talking about the uh, length, as it were. The wicket keeper will be allowed to move when the ball has been delivered by the bowler, either touches the bat or person of the striker or passes the wicket at the striker's end or the striker attempts a run. So until either of those three happens, then the wicket keeper shall remain wholly behind the bowling crease, which we all know is in line with the stumps at the striker's end. In the event of the wicket keeper contravening this law position, the striker's end umpire shall call and signal no ball as soon as the delivery has been bowled and the umpire sees that the wicket keeper has come in front of the stumps uh, before any of the three points above having happened. 
quite often when there is a stumping and it is referred to a TV umpire, the TV umpire will first check that there wasn't a, a front foot no ball by the bowler. Uh, and then he or she will check that there wasn't a uh, back foot no ball by the bowler. And then once the camera angle moves to square of the wicket, the TV umpire will check that there was no infringement of this positioning law by the wicket keeper in terms of if and when the hands got in front of the stumps. Okay, so the ball would have had to have gotten past the stumps before the wicket keeper collected it, or the striker must have uh, hit the ball, or uh, the ball must have made contact with the person of the striker, or the striker had attempted a run. Now, double stepping down the wicket to try and play a shot does not constitute attempting a run. So the wiki keeper will still have to wait until the ball passes the stumps before collecting the ball and affecting the stumping. So there's a clear picture of a wiki keeper infringing on his position. The hands are well in front of the stumps and the bowling crease. And so even though the striker is out of the crease and could be outstumped, here we shall call no ball because the wicketkeeper has collected the ball in front of the stumps. How is a wicketkeeper allowed to move? After the ball comes into play and before it reaches the striker, it is unfair if the wicketkeeper significantly alters his or her position in relation to the striker's wicket, except in the following cases. Movement of a few paces forward for a slow delivery, unless in doing so, it brings him or her within the reach of the wicket. So quite often when a bowler is about to bowl a slower ball, he or she will indicate to the wicketkeeper uh, that he or she is going to bowl a slower delivery. And so the wicket keeper will, as the bowler is about to bowl the ball, walk a few steps towards the stumps, which is allowable by law as long as the wicket keeper does not end up right up against the stumps. Okay, because then that would be considered a significant change in position. The wicket keeper is also allowed lateral movement in response to the direction in which the ball has been delivered. So I mentioned last week about Mahendra Singh Dhoni uh, quite often affecting stumpings down lakeside where he would have uh, noted to his bowler that the striker is batting outside his crease or the striker has a tendency to uh, take a few paces outside his crease when playing the shot. So there's a chance of being able to stump the batter down leg side. So obviously with this plan in action, Mahendra Singh Dhoni would move down the leg side as soon as the ball is bowled, which is perfectly allowable as per this law. The wicketkeeper is also allowed to move in response to the stroke that the striker is playing or that his actions suggest he intends to play. And we've got a nice picture later of uh, a Bangladeshi wicketkeeper responding to the stroke that Temba Bovuma played in a test match in 2017. In the event of unfair movement by the wicket keeper, either umpire shall call and signal dead ball. Okay, so incorrect positioning, we call and signal no ball. Incorrect or unfair movement by the wicket keeper, 
either umpire shall call and signal dead ball. Try and make that call before anybody gets stumped or run out, uh, just so that there is no confusion. The ball is dead and nothing else can happen after you call and signal dead ball. So here's the picture of uh, Timba Bavuma uh, being caught down the leg side by the Bangladeshi wicketkeeper. So the bowler uh, was a spin bowler who bowled, I think, right arm over the wicket and Timba Bavuma shaped to play a paddle and noticing the position of the batter the wicket keeper moved from his normal position behind the stumps uh, a meter or two down leg stump and was able to affect a great catch due to his anticipation made by watching the shot that Temba Bavuma was about to play. Okay, so that is perfectly legal as per the law we've just read. Can the wicket keeper interfere with the striker? Let's see what the law says. If in playing at the ball or in the legitimate defense of his wicket, the striker interferes with the wicket keeper, he or she shall not be out except as provided by obstructing the field. So this is actually a case where the striker is interfering with the wicketkeeper. Um, let's take an example where a short pitched uh, delivery is bold and the batter fends it away. Um, but as the short pitch delivery is coming down, the batter realizes that it might actually off the bat now fall onto the stumps and the wicket keeper realizing that the ball is up in the air is rushing towards the stump to affect catch and then the batter plays the ball away in a legal second strike of the ball to defend his stumps. However, law tells us in 37.3 obstructing the field that if this lawful striking, second striking of the ball pre prevents a catch from being taken, then the striker can be given out obstructing the field. That's law 27, the wicket keeper. Now we move on to law 28, the fielder. And just so you know, the wicket keeper is a fielder, but there is a specific law for the wicket keeper because of the special uh, protective equipment that he or she is allowed, as well as the uh, movements and position that are specific to the wiki keeper. Let's have a look at what is and isn't allowed for the other 10 fielders on the field. We've spoken in a few other parts of the law about protective helmets belonging to the fielding side, and we saw that it was one of the ways that a ball becomes automatically dead is when the ball goes through the wicket keeper's legs and hits the helmet behind the wicket keeper that is placed on the ground. So when not in use by fielders, protective helmets should be placed on the ground behind the wicket keeper and in line with both stumps. Uh, that is the most hidden position on the field. So that is why the law suggests that this is where that spare helmet should be placed. If a protective helmet belonging to the fielding side is on the ground and the ball while in play strikes it, the ball shall immediately become dead and the umpires need to award five penalty runs 
to the batting side. Any runs completed by the batters before the ball st striked the protective helmet shall be scored together with the run in progress if the ball had already crossed at the instant of the ball striking the helmet. We did mention last week that even though the ball becomes automatically dead in this scenario, it is good umpiring technique for either umpire to call and signal dead ball. Why? Because I can guarantee you not all 11 fielders and two batters will have seen the ball striking the protective helmet behind the wicketkeeper. So just for everybody to know that the ball is dead, call and signal dead ball. It shall not be re uh, but law allows for the runs to be scored uh, as depicted on this slide. Okay, even if the ball had, even if the run had not been completed before the ball hit the helmet, as long as the batters had crossed before the ball hits the helmet, then that run will count along with the five penalty runs awarded to the batting side. So that's it from my side in terms of presenting laws this evening, short and sweet on the fielder and the wicketkeeper. We're now going to go into our revision questions, which cover all four of the laws that we have gone through this evening. And Abdullah, I'm going to ask you for some hands and some help to answer these questions. The first one is to do with uh, substitute fielders, and you covered this quite thoroughly. The question is, at the start of the innings, the fielding captain seeks permission from the opposing captain for a substitute to act as their wicketkeeper. Is this allowed? What will who say? And what will happen as the match starts? Will a substitute act as a wicketkeeper? Abdullah, a nice tricky one to start. Do we have any volunteers with their hands up to answer? Uh, yes, Tom. Uh Timmy Tope, I saw your hand raised first, so if you can unmute yourself and answer the question, please. Yes, a substitute can act as a wicket, a wicket keeper if the opposite captain accepts. Timmy Tope, are you sure that it's the opposing captain that uh, accepts that um, request? The umpires as well, but the um, opposite captain can as well um, permit it as well. I don't know if that's right. So the, I think the first thing that Abdullah presented this evening um, is that a substitute will be allowed solely by the umpires, okay? The opposing captain cannot decline this request as it is not for the opposing captain to grant a substitute, but for the umpires alone to make that decision. The umpires may allow the substitute to keep wicket if the wicket keeper got injured during the warm up before the start of the match. Um, I think what you might be remembering from level one, Temi Tope, is that the captain of a player who is injured during the warm up can request a change to the nomination sheet. And that request will be made to the opposing captain. And a change to the nomination sheet means that the person who comes in as a replacement player will take full part in the match. Can bat, can bowl, can keep wicket, uh, can even captain the side. 
OK, uh, that is very different to a substitute. A substitute can only field and keep wicket at the authority or the allow allowance of the umpires. OK, um, but in terms of allowing a substitute, the opposing captain is not involved or cannot decline the request. OK, that is solely for the umpires to decide. Next question. Explain the procedure to follow if a fielder fails to take the field at the start of the match or at any later time or leaves the field during play. Abdullah explained this on field technique uh, very well, very thoroughly. There are a few things that we need to ask and we need to do um, so that we have, have all our ducks in a row for when a player leaves the field. Abdullah, do we have anybody who can tell us the procedure to follow? Uh, yes, Tom, we have two hands that are raised. Uh, Jitindra, your, hands were, your hand were raised first. You can unmute yourself, please. Good evening, all. Yeah. So, explain the procedure to follow if a fielder. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, loud and clear, Yeah, 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 yeah. So, for uh, if a fielder fails to take the field at the start of the match or any later time. Yeah. The first thing, uh, the fielder who is uh, uh, leading the field during the match should inform the umpires why he is he leaving the field. So this is the first thing we have to note. Second thing is the time when he is leaving the field. Just to make a note for the calculation of the penalty time to be served when he comes back on the field. So these are the basic two things which the umpire has to follow. Perfect. Um, Abdullah also mentioned um, uh, two things as an umpire that we need to do or, 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 or we need to ask two people to tell us something uh, when they come back, when that injured person needs to come back. This is for four marks, Jitendra, so we need to add those things as well. Okay, so as well as he comes back on the field of play, if he tells us or if we notice, I mean, the umpire notices, then he has to uh, write the time of the coming back. So then he has to calculate, like say, for example, he was 20 minutes off the field, then for the next 20 minutes, he'll not be, be allowed to bowl or bat. He has to serve the penalty time. There is a unserved penalty time. He has to, playing time he has to be served. Uh, great, Jitendra. Let's have a look at the textbook answers. The umpires need to be informed of the reason for this absence. He or she shall not thereafter come onto the field of play during a session of play without the consent of the umpire. The umpire shall give such consent as soon as it's practical, and he or she shall not be permitted to bowl until having been back on the field of play and served penalty time. Okay, well done, Jitendra. I would give you four out of four marks there. Thank you, sir. Next question is a penalty time calculation. Um, so let's get our calculators out and our thinking caps on. In a 50 over match that started at 10 a.m., the opening bowler, Wendy, pulls a groin and leaves the field at 10.09. She returns with the permission of the umpire, which is great, at 10.31. When can Wendy bowl again? Abdullah, do we have a hand up to take us through this calculation of penalty time? Yes, yes Tom. The first hand raised is uh, Arun, if you can unmute yourself and take us through the penalty time question. Yeah, good evening all. Uh, now that she has left the field at 10.09 hours and she is uh, come back with the permission of the umpire at 10.31 hours, she has been out of the field for uh, 21 min uh, 22 minutes. So starting 10.31, further 22 minutes, that is at uh, 10.53, she can bowl. Well done. 
Very well done. Uh, that is exactly as per the memorandum. Uh, Wendy left the field um, at 10.09 and returned at 10.31. That is a penalty time of 22 minutes that she was off the field for. She needs to serve that penalty time when she comes back on before she may bowl again. Uh, 22 minutes from 10.31 is indeed 10.53 that she can bowl again. Well done. I think that was Ash. Next question is also a penalty time question. This one is a, a little bit um, more involved. Let us read it through before we can take answers off the floor. In a 50-over match that started at 10 a.m., the opening bowler, Peter, pulls a hamstring and leaves the field at 10.30. He returns with the permission of the umpire at 10.45. At 11.05, the fielding captain asks you when Peter can bowl again. So, Abdullah, do we have a hand up? Who would like to attempt this penalty time question? Yes, Tom, we do have a hand up, but it's uh, it's Arun that answered the previous question. So I'm just giving uh, five more seconds to see if I see any other hands. If not, I'll, uh, we can ask Arun to answer it. But now I see lots of other hands. Uh, Bavin, your hand will raise first. Bavin, if you can unmute yourself. <laughs> Now, as Peter has pulled up his hamstring at 10 o'clock and he is uh, off the field and returns at 10.45. So he is out for 15 minutes. He's Correct. At 11.05, the captain asks him that if he can bowl or bat. Still, I think he has uh, another... 10 minutes to solve before he bowls. Uh, let's just go through it step by step. Uh, you were quite right in saying that he has been off the field for 15 minutes. Um, so now at 10.45, when he comes back onto the field, how much penalty time does he owe you? Uh, it's okay. 15 minutes. Yeah, so okay. I think he can... Is allowed to bowl because he has already served his 15 minutes and has uh, extra five minutes also in the game. Yes, so actually he was allowed to bowl at 11 a.m. already. Okay, so yeah. um, the, 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 the trick here is that the captain only asks you after his bowler is already allowed to bowl. Uh, and in fact, a good umpiring practice is for you when Peter comes back onto the field at 10.45 is to quickly do a calculation and figure out in your head that or on your notes that he will be allowed to bowl again at 11 a.m. And you inform Peter, the captain, uh, sorry, Peter, the bowler, as well as the fielding captain when Peter can bowl again. Um, we need to be proactive in this regard and we should not wait for the fielding captain to ask us when the bowler can bowl again. Okay, so well done. We've eventually figured that out. So I think this one gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, in a 50-over match that starts at 10 a.m., the opening batter, John, pulls a hamstring and leaves the field at 1,100 hours. He returns with the permission of the umpire at 12.45. The innings of the batting side ends at 1,300 hours. And let us assume that uh, lunch is taken immediately um, in our playing conditions. Our lunch break for 50 overs is uh, 40 minutes. So the side B will start batting at 1340. 
So the question is, uh, John normally being the opening batter of side B, uh, when can he bat? He's been off the field for one hour, 45 minutes. And then he's on the field for 15 minutes before the end of the innings. When can he bat in the next innings? Abdullah, do we have a hand to take us through this slightly higher grade calculation? Yes, Tom. Um, we do have a few hands. First hand raised um, was Pavan. Pavan, if you can unmute yourself, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Uh, sir, uh, since uh, penalty time is applicable only to a fielder, so here batsman going out will not matter. So he can open the innings. Thank you. Uh, Bhavan, unfortunately that is incorrect. Uh, Abdullah mentioned that um, penalty time carries over into the next innings and even into the next day if it's a multiple day match. So we need to apply the penalty time. The question is how much are we going to apply and exactly when are we going to apply it? Abdullah, do we have another hand up okay, to sir. try and attempt can, this? Can I try, sir? Okay, sure. Go for it, Bhavan. I, I actually misread that. I thought batsman while batting uh, went out because of the pull, pulled ham, hamstring. So he's fielder only. While fielding only, he left, right? Yes, yes. Sorry. Um, maybe the question was not clear. The, he, he is a batter, but he wasn't batting at the time. He was fielding at the time when he pulled the hamstring. Okay, so, so at 11, 11 o'clock, he went and came back at 13 o'clock. 12.45. So, sorry, ah, 12.45. So what is the lunch time, sir? So the innings ended at 1300. Innings of the batting ended at 1300, okay. So he was absent from 11 to 12.45. That is uh, 60 plus 45, 105 minutes. Okay, right, what sir? did we say about penalty time? Is there a limit to penalty time? Yes, 90, 90 minutes. Okay, perfect. Right, uh, total, now. Uh, total. Yes, sir. Now. When, so so at 12.45, when he came back onto the field, he owed us 90 minutes. Uh, 90 now we minutes, see yes. that from 12.45 until 1300, he was on the field fielding, so he is serving penalty time. How many minutes of penalty time did he serve? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So now at lunchtime, he owes us... 90 minus 15 minutes, which is? 75. 75 minutes. Great. So now we have um, heard from Abdullah that the scheduled break of lunch will not count for or against him. So at 13.40, when the lunch break ends, he yes. still owes us 75 minutes. So when can he bet? 13.40 plus 75 minutes. What time would that be? 14.40, 14.55 or five weekends, Four. whichever is earlier. Perfect, Pavan. 14.55 or five wickets down, whichever is earlier. Okay, let's just read to make sure that we've got that correct. We've noted, it's important to note that he was off the field for 105 minutes, but penalty time is maximized at 90 minutes. Okay. So when he returned at 12.45, he only owed us 90 minutes. He was on the field for 15 minutes. 
So when John's side starts to bat, he will have to wait a further 75 minutes. Um, all his side is five wickets down, whichever comes first, you're quite right. The reason that no time is given in the um, exam is that law does not stipulate a, an exact time, uh, an exact duration for a lunch break. OK, um, so that's why it just tells us that 45 minutes after his side starts batting, he will be allowed to bet. Sorry, 75 minutes after his side starts batting, he will be allowed to bet again. Or when his side is five wickets down, and the memorandum should also say whichever comes first. So well done, Bhavan. Um, Thank you. Thank I you, will sir. Clear, I will clear up that question for, for the next time we use it, um, because you're quite right. It wasn't uh, explicit that John was actually in the field when he pulled his hamstring. Um, indeed, okay, you, you are because right. Because of that only got confused. Sure. In, indeed, you are right. Um, a batter when injured while batting um, does not incur penalty time. Uh, he just retires hurt and then can come back at the fall of uh, any subsequent wicket or at the retirement of another batsman. So well done there, Bhavan. And that brings us to the end of uh, this evening's revision questions. Uh, now I'm going to go and have a look at the questions that have been posed in the chat group. And I saw the first one come in from Tabit Peterson asking, uh, who do we make contact with regards to the date we want to take the exam on? So Tabit, uh, if you are a member of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association, then all you need to do is you need to email me. You can email me on tom.mukorosi at gmail.com or training at wpcua.co.za. I get both of those inboxes and read them daily. You just need to let me know if you're going to write on Saturday the 16th of July or Monday the 18th of July. I hope I've got those dates right. Um, just note that the Saturday sitting is 9 a.m. until 11 a.m. and the Monday sitting is 18.30 in the evening until 20.30 at night. Okay, two hours for the exam, 100 100 marks, um, 120 minutes. And remember that the questions are not true or false. They're not multiple choice. We need to write out full sentences as we have seen in the revision questions. If you are paying for the exam, so you're not a member of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association, then you need to make payment uh, as per the email I've sent, um, on every email that I've sent, I've also sent the payment details. So just read through those, any one of those emails. When you get a proof of payment from your bank, you need to send that proof of payment to yourself first and then forward it to me on either of those two email addresses. And on that email, you need to specify your date and obviously the time will be as per the the times i've mentioned uh, whether it's going to be on saturday 16 july or monday 18th july okay i hope that answers your question um tabit and i will type in my email address right now because i see somebody's just asked for it okay and that's the one, and the other one is, um, I do prefer that you send emails to 
training at wpcua.co.za. Why? Because on that email address, I only get emails related to cricket. On my Gmail address, I get hundreds of emails a day from all sorts of people, um, and I can easily miss an email. Uh, whereas uh, with training at wpcua.co.za, it's easier for me to see emails coming in because I know that they are all cricket related. Okay. Next question is from Njuguna. A player has been out for 20 minutes, say from 10 a.m. until 10.20. From 10 20 it starts raining and play is interrupted for 15 minutes at 10 35 play resumes and the player is allowed back on the field on the resumption of the game how would you calculate that penalty time abdullah i suggest that is your forte uh, please help njuguna with that one uh, thank you tom thank you njuguna for your question so, Nzakuna, the first question that you need to ask yourself is whether player X was on the field of play at the time when it started raining. If your answer to that question is yes, and that player returns with the side after the rain interruption, you can then offset the uh, the um, unscheduled break against the penalty time that that player owes. If your answer to the, to the question is no, if that player was not on the field of play at the start of the interruption, then for that player to offset the rain interruption against the penalty time that uh, that player owes, that player needs to inform either of the umpires in person. And from that moment that he that the player informs either of the umpires, then the penalty time will start. Will, you can then start offsetting the penalty time. So looking at your question, and if I ask myself the question, is this player on the field of play at the start of the interruption? Uh, and you're saying in the first sentence, the player has been off for 20 minutes from 10 till 10.20. And then at 10.20, it starts raining. So that tells me this player was not on the field of play at the start of the rain interruption. So what now needs to happen is you now need to, that player needs to personally inform either of the umpires. Then only you can offset the rain interruption. So in this case, he's not on the field. I don't see uh, that player personally informing the umpire, so you cannot offset that interruption. So this player still owes the 20 minutes. So at 10, 20, 35, when play resumes, uh, you need to inform that player as well as um, the captain that the player can bowl again at 10.55. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Next question comes from Amarjit. If the wicketkeeper brings his or her hand front of the stumps while the striker strikes the ball, what decision should be taken by the striker's end umpire? Um, so I can take that one, Dula. Uh, Amarjit, as per the law, uh, the Wicketkeeper is allowed to move in front of the stumps after the striker has made contact with the ball. So it will be a judgment call from the strikers and umpire as to whether the wicketkeeper moved in front of the stumps before the striker hit the ball or after um, if the wicketkeeper moved and the 
strikers and umpire judged that the wicketkeeper moved exactly as the striker hit the ball in front of the stumps. Um, Abdullah, I should think that is uh, legal. I'm just going back to my notes to double check. Um, but yeah, it will be, again, like I said, a judgment call um, as to when exactly the umpire thought that the wicketkeeper moved in front of the stumps. Was it before exactly as the striker hit the ball or after? Um, Abdullah, are you happy that if it's simultaneous, then it is legal? Yeah, as soon as, the stri- as soon as the striker touched the ball, the keeper is allowed to put his hands in front of the stumps. So for me, uh, yes, um, in your example, when there is a touch, the keeper can put his hand in front. So simultaneously, uh, I'm happy with the thumb. Thanks for clearing that up, Dula. Uh, Sriniketh asks, what time will be the online exam on the 16th or the 18th of July? Uh, Sriniketh, it depends on your um, time zone, uh, but it will be the same time as the written exam at Newlands Cricket Ground. So 9 a.m. on Saturday, the 16th of July is 12.30, just after noon Indian time, if I'm not mistaken. There's a three and a half hour time difference between South Africa and India. So what will happen is on Friday, the 15th of July, all of you who have emailed me to say that you are going to write your exam online on the Saturday and you have paid for uh, that online exam um, sitting, I will email you guys a link on Microsoft Teams, you will join that meeting the next morning, South African time, and at five minutes before nine South African time, I will join that meeting, and I will also email all of you in that meeting the question paper for the level two exam. Uh, You will have two hours to complete the exam, you'll be writing on printed answer sheets. I will send you those uh, answer sheets also on uh, Friday so that you can print them out uh, before you write. And once you have completed your exam, you will scan and email your answer sheet to me. And we will also need you to share your screen showing you deleting the email where you received the question paper because we don't want the question paper circulated to uh, anyone other than those candidates writing on that specific date. So obviously the same process will be followed for Monday the 18th of July. I will uh, email Uh, those candidates who are writing online the Microsoft Microsoft Teams link uh, probably Monday morning and uh, you will all log in 25 minutes after 1800 hours South African time and then I will send the exam question paper via email and you shall all take two hours to complete your exam, scan and email it. You can scan using your cell phone, but that will be the only time that you're allowed to use your mobile phone. Your cameras will be on so that we can um, watch you while you write the exam. And so please make sure that you do have a, um, a device that has a camera and that the camera is on and your microphone also has to be on so that we hear that you are alone in the room and are not communicating with anyone 
while writing the exam remotely. Uh, Shrini Keth, I hope that answers your question on the logistics around the remote writing of the level two exam. Next question is from Bavin. Bavin asks about the last example of the revision question. And um, I think he was confused and we've cleared up that confusion that um, Johnny, John was actually uh, fielding when he got injured and left uh, the field. Right, uh, Pavan is asking for the level one presentation, which I forgot to send out to him last week. I'll do that at the end of this lecture, Pavan. Amarjit, I think we have answered the question about the hands in front of the stumps. And uh, Temi Tope, um, can you use your mobile phone for um, writing remotely? Uh, Temi Tope, I would advise against using your mobile phone uh, while writing um, the exam remotely. Why? Because you will be reading the questions of the question paper off your mobile phone. I'm not sure how easy that will be depending on the size of your mobile phone. Um, I would suggest that you try and get a hold of a laptop or a desktop or uh, even a, um, a tablet uh, to use to be able to read the questions off your uh, device in a bigger format than it would be on a phone. Um, if, however, the phone is the only device that you can get, uh, then we will make an exception for you, Temi Tope. Um, but please, by all means, try and get a, a bigger device uh, because we also don't want you uh, touching your screen um, very often uh, because you could be uh, searching for other information on your phone rather than just flipping through the um, exam question paper. Um, whereas with a laptop, you will be just scrolling down using your arrow keys to go from the one question to the next, right? So we would prefer you using a laptop or a desktop or even a tablet. Um, but if you do not have any other device, then a mobile phone um, is the last resort. Okay, uh, yes, you're quite right. Um, uh, Internet cafe would be very noisy. So we prefer you to be on your own in a quiet room um, so then a phone will suffice. That is all the questions I see on the chat box for now. Uh, so we'll move on to the hands in the um, room. Srini Keth, you've got your hand up. Uh, please unmute your mic and ask any question if we haven't yet answered it. Yeah, so okay, um, no problem. Jitindra, you've still got your hand up. Uh, please unmute your microphone and um, ask your question. Yeah, yeah. So my question is: uh, the fielding side, uh, there is a drink break, and after the drink break, the fielding side, one of the fielder, nominated player, goes out, and a substitute comes in without the information of either umpire. So both of the umpire doesn't know about any changes of the fielding. Neither the captain informs the umpires. Now, uh, how do we treat that substitute fielder who is on the field without the uh, information or information of the umpire? Are we going to uh, have any penalty firings like if he comes in touch with the ball or 
we should uh, uh, return the fielder outside and ask the nominee to come in or what exactly are we supposed to do thank you good question jitendra you want to take that one tula Yeah, copy that, Tom. Yes, I'll take it. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Ditindra. Uh, great question. And that question was handled by the uh, ICC uh, Law Committee uh, recently. And they've answered it as follows. That player will also be subject to the same penalty as per the law, as per re a player returning without permission. So, i.e., the ball will become dead. Uh, five penalty runs will be awarded. Uh, ball will not count uh, as one for the over. Uh, runs completed uh, will count together with the run in progress at the instant of the offence will also count. Um, the um, You will inform everyone and, and report as well. So to answer your question, yes, we'll, uh, we'll get the same penalty as a player returning without permission. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, Titindra. Thanks, Dula. Um, Triniketh, you've got your hand up again. Do you have a question for us? Yeah, yeah. Or... yeah Go ahead. Yeah, that's, uh, the thing is, uh, I tried the PayPal thing uh, on my mobile and it is, it is showing some error. So if, uh, if I have uh, the option of uh, doing an international bank transfer uh, through the money exchange or through some bank, and if I send you the the details of that payment, that will work, sir. Uh, yes, Shuniketh, uh, no problem at all. Um, whatever you used for level one that worked, um, I think go and try that as well for level two. Uh, if you had paid uh, Harsha, uh, then you yeah. can uh, try um, direct uh, money transfer to my account. Uh, the details are listed in uh, full on the email. Um, all of the emails I've been oh. sending so far. So uh, that I have to send the money uh, from the money transfer to your account, and I have to share the details through my mail to your mail. That's correct, yes. So that I know which day you want to write the exam. Yes, sir. perfect. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, you're welcome, Shmiriket. All the best. Thank you. Nanesh, good evening. Um, I I gather you had a game this weekend. Uh, the floor is yours. Let us know how it went or ask a question about tonight's lecture. Uh, good evening, Tom, and good evening, Abdullah, and good evening, all. Yes, I do. Uh, I did a couple of games last weekend. And uh, I do have a few questions, uh, not so many this time. Uh, first one is the fielder position, um, especially when someone wants to field behind the keeper or um, behind the bowler. Um, normally, behind the bowler, um, I always say not uh, um, within the, uh, I mean, in front of the side screen, that's what normally I said. Uh, after that, either side of the side screen is fine. But sometimes the people complaining about the fielder behind the keeper. I said there is no rule uh, behind the keeper. So, so is there something uh, really we can say uh, that a fielder standing behind exactly on the keeper? And how can we say to the fielding captain or any players, especially in the... Uh, club level uh, when we do club level empiring. Um Nanesh, we've just gone through the fielder law. There is uh, no restriction as to where a fielder may or may not stand, except for on the pitch. Um, the fielder cannot encroach onto the pitch. Otherwise, the umpire shall call and signal noble. Um, also, I imagine the reason why normally um, there isn't a fielder in line with the side screen behind the bowler's end umpire is because that um, that fielder would need to stand still. Otherwise, 
he or she would be distracting the striker because they're in full view in line of the striker's um, eyesight. Um, so as long as that fielder does not make any dramatic moves to distract the striker, there is nothing in the law um, that disallows the fielder from being in line with the side screen uh, behind the bowlers and umpire. Um, you know, some batters hit perfectly straight over the bowler's head. Um, if you want to protect that boundary, then definitely protect that boundary as a fielding captain. Um, you are indeed allowed. Like I said, the only restriction is that the fielder should not move such that they will distract the striker before the ball is bowled. Um, behind the wicket keeper, it's quite common in school cricket for a backstop to field in that position. Um, right on the boundary or a few meters in from the boundary, it doesn't matter. It's totally allowed. Um, as long as we are not um, infringing on the restrictions of two fielders maximum behind square on the leg side. That's the um, case, actually. Uh, the fielder who is uh, near the boundary behind the wicket keeper, uh, he is just trying to come on towards the leg side um, as soon as the bowler bowls and batsman trying to play um, a flick or maybe scoop. Um, that's what happening, actually. That's where this comes. Yeah, so, so quickly can... <laughs> so, so he the, the that that fielder's starting position. If there are two other fielders behind square on the leg side, then that fielder's starting position needs to be um, on the offside of um, middle stump. So pretty much right behind the wicket keeper because the wicket keeper generally stands a little bit to the offside more than the leg side. So that is perfectly legal. Um, once the delivery is bold, then um, that fielder can, can move. And that fielder is allowed to move um, significantly if he or, so, he or she wishes, um, because they will not be in the sight of the striker so will not be distracting the striker's uh, view uh, but very importantly uh, the fielder needs to wait until the ball is delivered before he or she can move. Abdullah I don't know if you have anything to add to those two positions um, and when they're allowed to move if they're allowed to move no, Tom, you've covered everything perfectly. Yeah. Nanesh, yeah, I hope that is yes. that point. Yes, thank <laughs> you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Abdullah. And the next one, which happened yesterday uh, in one one game, uh, which I was umpiring, um, I was at a bowlers and umpire, and the ball bowls a short short pitch ball, uh, which is. Uh, Pass about the head of the striker standing uh, upright at the popping crease. Um, but the ampere at the striker's end uh, first signals me uh, first warning for the bowler. So I gave, uh, I was a little bit surprised. I thought it should be no ball, uh, it should be white ball because it's above the head uh, when I saw from striker, uh, bowlers and ampere. But I just stick to my colleague and I also gave first warning to the bowler and I'm signaling the batsman as well. But Couple of seconds later, uh, my colleague says, "Oh, it's a white ball," and then uh, he gave signal first warning. So then immediately I revoked my signal, and then I gave white ball to the scorer, and then signal again uh, the first warning for the over. Is that correct? Uh, should I continue just to give signal to the scorer without revoking the first warning? Uh, so I think uh, Nanesh. It's it's not really a um, it's not a warning. It's just to say that the playing conditions in limited overs cricket, uh, if it was a 50 over match, you would be allowed two short pitch deliveries over shoulder height 
in uh, over. So um, that signal is to say that this is the first short pitch delivery over shoulder height in the over. And yes, if it is a wide, usually you would signal wide first and then you would signal that this was the first short pitch delivery over shoulder height in this over. Um, I don't think there is anything technically wrong with signaling uh, one short pitch delivery for the over first before signaling wide. Um, it's just that we have commonly always seen the wide signaled before the one for the over. Um, also, I think it would have looked a bit odd that you were cancelling one for the over, then you signal wide, and then you signaled one for the over again. Uh, so in essence, you actually weren't supposed to cancel the one for the over. Um, yes, it's it's slightly in the wrong sequence that you would signal one for the over first and then signal wide. Um, but I'm not sure if it was correct for you to cancel that signal. Uh, Abdullah, your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, Tom, correct umpiring technique is to first signal the wide and the first signal the wide, wait for acknowledgement and then signal one for the over uh, to the batter as well as to the bowler. Yeah, so should should he have cancelled his uh, one for the over, especially uh, because the the one for the over is signaled to the batters and the fielders, uh, and the bowler. It's not signaled uh, to the scorers. Scorers, yeah, co correct. Um, correct practice is first the wide and then the uh, signal the one for the over to the batter and the bowler. But if he did it the other way around, ugh, it's not, not the end of the world. He should have just stuck to. He did now signal in uh, in that instance one to the bowler first. Um, sorry, yeah. one for the over first, and then the wide. You shouldn't have, uh, Nanesh. You shouldn't have cancelled or revoked your signal and then signal wide and go back. You should have just um, kept it. Um, yes, you signal one for the over. So just left it so and then signal wide. But going forward, first the wide, then signal the one for the over to the batter and the bowler. Yes, at the okay. first, I, I, at the end of the match, I thought I should have waited a couple of seconds and then ask my colleague, is it wide or not, and then signal the for one for the over. And but the split second, I just won uh, that one, and then when he said wide, I reworked the signal. Then I was like, uh, sh I think I shouldn't have done this one. Then I asked, uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for clarifying, uh, Abdullah and Tom. And the next one is uh, we have Nanesh, got... just just quickly before you move on. Um, remember what I said on Wednesday last week. Uh, for no balls, you should try and signal, call and signal them as early as possible. But for wides, you should wait and especially look at your partner. If you give him a look as to you thought it was a wide and he's not signaling wide then he or she might get the hint that you feel that it's a wide and then they will eventually signal wide. So just give it some time. You do not have to signal wide immediately. It is a decision uh, that does sometimes require thought. So um, don't be in a rush to signal one for the over. Um, yes, you're right. He should have signaled wide before he signaled one for the over. Um, but between the two of you, uh, try and discuss nonverbal signals before the match. And also, uh, yeah, give him some time. If you think that it's a wide, give him some time to signal wide. And then you can, can signal wide as well. Okay. Um, uh, Tom, just, just, just to add, um, Nanesh, so, so when it's a wide, uh, uh, when your colleague signals a wide, um, it's uh, then fairly obvious that it is one for the over. So mm -hmm. he actually doesn't need to 
to tell you uh, after signaling um, why to you that it is one for the over. Uh, he can, I mean, it's nothing stopping him, but uh, I think it's fairly obvious that if he signal wide, then that is one for the over. Um, also, um, school, uh, your strikers in umpire is in uh, the best position to um, to make that call. So work as a team. Um, if you think it's, it's, um, it's, let's say, not above uh, uh, um, um, shoulder height, and your colleague signal to you or one or signals to you wide and maybe you think it's not a wide, go with uh, your strikers in um, umpire score. There's nothing worse on a cricket field than when strikers in signals wide and strikers in keeps his hand, uh, um, so the signal of wide and the bowlers in umpire doesn't acknowledge and ignore strikers in. It just um, gives the impression that the two umpires are not in sync. They're not working as a team. Uh, thanks, Tom. Yep. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Abdullah. Uh, I think we have one more hand raised. Maybe you can answer uh, uh, Erfan, and then I will come thanks. back with my question. Thanks, Nanesh. Uh, oh, sorry. Dr. Nanesh, Erfan, uh, good evening. Uh, please, good evening, Tom and yours. Abdullah and everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Just to jump on to this thing. Uh, uh, it's a very interesting topic we just discussing here. Uh, in this situation, if I am a bowler and umpire, I discuss this thing. I know we arrange uh, with my other partner. Uh, in this situation, if this happened to Janesh. I would signal not a full wide, but a little wide, just like my palms are across my hips, showing, just mm -hmm. giving him indication. Okay, this could be wide. This is a wide, a soft signal to my partner. So in that way, he could just raise his full hands as a wide. So I try to, you know, we, we, we have a, a arrangements uh, before the match saying that, OK, we will do that, like tapping if it is uh, touching the body or the pad, uh, just tapping your uh, palm uh, on your leg, uh, knee. And if it is a catch, then tapping on your fingers, uh, that kind of arrangements I do. Is that the good way, Tom? Efran, that is 100% uh, correct. Um, that is how we do it as well in South Africa. And Thank I you. always encourage, um, especially if you're standing for the first time with a different umpire, exactly. to go yes. through and agree those uh, signals before the match so that if I'm doing something or I'm showing you something, you know exactly what I'm showing you. You don't have to guess and think what on earth is Tom showing me. Um, and you're quite right. That signal from the um, strikers and umpire doesn't need to be a full signal. It can be somewhat discreet. Uh, yep. The full signal needs to come from the bowlers and umpire. Um, I think just the issue with um, Nanesh is um, the strikers and umpire first signal uh, one short for the over, which uh, normally means that it's not over the head. It's it's just above shoulder height, but below head height. And then I think that umpire subsequently changed his mind and then showed wide. Um, so So there was a change of signal there, perhaps. Um, so, so my piece of advice to Nanesh was, yeah, maybe just remember to wait a little bit, and and if you don't agree with um, that signal, maybe your body language could also be towards signaling a wide, even though you're not signaling a wide yet. Um, but that would maybe prompt the strikers and umpire to say, okay, yes, I agree, it was actually over the head height. Um, so it should be a wide. Um, so yeah, those type of things do take time to develop, uh, especially with a new partner, uh, but yes, with experience right. and with the pre-match communication, um, you can easily sort that out. Thank Thanks you, for thank that you, input. Thank you. Uh, because uh, these days I, I, I'm doing with a lot of new rookie umpires, so I have to just, you know, kind of uh, pre-signal uh, little tutorials we have. So that that's helping us. That's helping. It's a great tool. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank Have you. Fun. Thank you, Tom Abdullah.
I see Bavesh has got uh, his hand up again. Uh, Bavesh, please unmute your microphone and uh, give us your question. It's uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, it's uh, related to same same discussion. Is it only the strikers and empire judge the white ball when it is a short pitch above the head? Uh, batsman standing upright in a pop increase, or is it also the bowling and umpire can clearly see that it is above his head and he can also give a white? Good question, Bavesh. And the simple answer is that the final ruling actually comes from the bowler's end umpire. Um, he or she will be the one to um, signal to the scorers um, the wide and also signal the one for the over to the batter and the bowler. However, um, the strikers and umpire is in a better position to judge the height of a short pitch delivery. In fact, a little umpiring technique that you can use is um, when a striker is standing upright at the crease, when they first come to the crease, then you need to stand up as well and in line with that striker's shoulder height, you need to find a benchmark uh, in on the horizon. Uh, maybe in the stands there is a particular line of chairs that is exactly that height. Uh, so you'll know that if a ball passes the um, the pop increase above the line of those chairs, then you um, will signal one for the over. And uh, two rows above that row of chairs, that is the line of the height of the striker standing upright at the crease. So if the ball goes above that line of chairs, then that will be a wide. Um, the bowlers and umpire doesn't have as good a view of the height of a delivery uh, simply because of depth perception, because you don't know exactly when the ball passes the striker, right? So you might see how high it goes, yes, but you don't know how high it was when it passed the striker um, standing upright at the crease. Uh, however, uh, I have seen it happen. It's not great when it does happen. I have seen bowlers and umpires overruling square leg umpires or strikers and umpires um, like abdullah said you're a team out there and it looks better if the bowlers and umpire accepts the signal from the strikers and umpire if the bowlers and umpire goes with his or her a different signal to what the strikers and umpire has signaled uh, then the players are immediately going to notice the lack of teamwork and will actually use that against you in the match going forward. You will also notice that whenever there is a short pitch delivery and um, it's tight, whether it's above shoulder height or above head height, the striker will normally look at the strikers and umpire for that call the bowler will normally look at the strikers and umpire for that call. Even the fielding captain will look at the strikers and umpire to make that call. So Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I think we 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 lost Tom midway through. We probably lost connectivity. Uh, we can give Tom um, a minute or two to get back online. Uh, but I think we've answered um, the, the question. Um, Tom, are you back on? I uh, know we uh, yeah. lost you for a uh, we lost you for a second. Uh, I somehow got uh, muted there, Abdullah. Oh, but, you got uh, muted. <laughs> okay. I hope I hope Babish, uh, 
question was answered. I guess it was it was answered. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Perfect. Uh, Nanesh, uh, the floor is yours. You can uh, ask another question if you wish. Uh, it's actually not a question. It's probably called as a suggestion. Uh, uh, what happening is uh, we are also uh, learning uh, to do the, the duties of the third empire uh, because we are uh, attending three empires for each match um, where two empires will be on the field. One empire uh, will be um, outside and who can help the um, on field empires. Uh, I just want to know um, what are the advices you will give to do while doing third empire. Uh, at this moment, I make some uh, printouts, I mean myself, uh, to wrote down the start time of the over and end time of the over, when the wicket fails, which both both the first over and which over, as well as the rain interruptions, other interruptions, and any ball lost, I mean the time waste by fielding side, I mean the injury times, ball lost, uh, the player leaving the field, those things I make myself one list. Uh, I, draw, I printed those ones and, and if you have any other suggestions, uh, if you can tell me uh, where we can find some um, useful tips uh, to do uh, the third empire duties, it will be really helpful. Uh, Nanesh, uh, you're very welcome. Um, we've got a presentation or in fact, we can't claim it. It was put together by former uh, international umpire um, here in South Africa. And um, I'm sure he'll be fine for us to share it with you. Um, so I do have your email address. I will just try and find it and uh, send it to you. It, it does specify the duties of a reserve umpire in an international match. So there's a lot of stuff that wouldn't uh, be the same for a domestic match um, or a club cricket match, uh, but it's always good to know um, the full duties at the highest level um, for a reserve umpire. And um, it's not a TV umpire, it is a third umpire in a non-televised match uh, that the duties will refer to. So, so I hope that that'll work for you. Uh, and the umpire that put it together, I'm sure um, Erfan uh, knows well, is uh, Johan Kluter. So very well respected umpire um, yes, Tom, over the you. years. I see a question of, has come in from Paul, one of uh, Western Province Cricket Umpires Association's members. Uh, are there recordings for the missed presentations prior to today? Uh, due to a combination of reasons, I couldn't attend. Uh, Paul, you are on the mailing list and I have um, been sending you all recordings of uh, every lecture after each lecture. So Paul, just check your emails from me. Uh, the subject of the email is the same as uh, when I send out the link for the meeting and then after the link after the meeting I just reply to all and I insert the recording of the video. Uh, if you haven't received those emails for whatever reason uh, you can ask me to resend you those recordings I'll do so. Nanesh, your hand is still up. Do you still have another question oh. for us? Oh, no, sorry. Um, no, sorry. Everything answered, Tom and Abdullah. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Nanesh, and everyone else who's contributed to another interactive session this evening. Uh, we really enjoy the questions and answers coming from you guys because that's how we all learn together. I will be sending out the recording of this lecture in about an hour's time and then we shall meet up again on Wednesday where we will be going through um, laws 30 as well as a few dismissal laws 
all the way up to 39, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, obviously, we're not going through every single uh, law and we're not going through all the details of the laws that we go through. Uh, what we're doing is we are presenting the parts of the law that are examined in the level two exam. Uh, so please, guys, that's why you don't see any red text in the presentation. Uh, what we're saying is that everything that we are presenting to you in this level two presentation is examined and that's why you need to focus on the entire presentation so thank you very much once again for joining us have a good evening further and see you all on wednesday thank you and good night thank you good night thank you thank you good night, yeah, good, good night everyone okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, sir.